Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins, a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and sacred scriptures, along with information on topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Diana Hencherenko on Young Adult Ministry. We will also look at the life of Saints Philip and James, as well as reflections on the readings for this fifth Sunday of Easter. That and more coming up on Wineskins. In our current issue, we will begin a new segment called The Bishop's Corner with Bishop David Bonner. Welcome to our new series called The Bishop's Corner. I'm Father Jim Corda. With me is Bishop David Bonner. Welcome to Wineskins. Thank you so much, Father Jim. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's the first time you're on Wineskins, and we look forward to having you on the first Sunday of the month in our special segment called The Bishop's Corner. You were ordained and installed on January 12th of this year, 2021, and about a month later, you issued a pastoral letter called Testify to the Light. We're going to spend some time over these next several months talking about that letter. Today, I'd like to ask two questions. First of all, why did you write the pastoral letter and why did you name it Testify to the Light? Well, I wrote the letter because as a incoming bishop, one of the questions that kept emerging in my prayer was, how are we going to move on from this very dark time of the pandemic? So I was led through my prayer to write this letter and to acknowledge the darkness, but at the same time to encourage people to move out of this darkness and offer a strategy of sorts in that regard. So I felt as a bishop, as one who's called to lead the flock, it was really important that I bring a vision of hope, a strategy as we move forward. And that really is something that it came natural, quite honestly, and I think it was of the spirit. And I think the opening image of testify to the light with the light and darkness is not only appropriate as we find ourselves still in the midst of this pandemic, but in our whole Christian life and in our complex and complexing world that we live in, you know, we're always fighting this constant battle between light and darkness. Why is it for us as Christians that we need to live our lives in the light instead of in the shadows? Jesus is the light of the world, and he calls us to live in his light. He calls us to be a light for the world. And on the day of our baptism, our parents and godparents are given a candle that is lit from the Paschal candle, and they're told to receive the light of Christ. And it is incumbent upon them to keep that light of faith burning in the heart of the new baptized. And of course, we all reach a point where we need to take responsibility and ownership for that light in our own lives. And so to be a Christian is to live in the light and to bring that light to the deepest darkness that is there. I know oftentimes throughout the pastoral letter, Bishop, you talk about Pope Francis as the joy of the gospel. That's really evident throughout the whole pastoral letter. Why was that important to you? Before I was ordained, I had to go on a retreat, a canonical retreat. And I asked all the bishops from Pittsburgh who or who had some connection to Pittsburgh over the years to help me in that regard and to offer some suggestions and recommendations in terms of how I might best use those retreat days. And one of the bishops strongly encouraged me to embrace the joy of the gospel from Pope Francis, his apostolic exhortation. And that really became for me the centerpiece of my retreat because it's such a beautiful reflection on what it is to be a disciple and how one is to grow in discipleship. And so I think that as we move forward and in my role as a bishop, it's really important for me to form disciples. And as those disciples are formed, to invite them to go out and form more disciples, one by one, two by two. It can make all the difference. One of the areas that I think I'd like us to focus on now is the sacramental life of the church. That's been disrupted because of the pandemic and this dark times that you noted. Why is it important for us as Catholics to get back into full steam ahead our sacramental life? Well, the sacramental life is where we are nourished and where we are strengthened. It's where we come together as a community. It really is synonymous with the Christian life. And during the pandemic, there were times when our doors were closed. We were unable to come together in that regard. And so I just felt it was important for us to step back and to look again at the richness, the beauty 
continuity of our sacramental life and all of the sacraments. What would you say to the folks that are with us who have not been back to church because of being afraid or whatever reason? What would you like to tell them about the church and about the importance of the Mass and the sacraments? I want to echo one of the commands that was given throughout the scriptures. Mary and Joseph heard it with their own ears. Do not be afraid. Our churches are safe. Our people wear masks. They keep social distances. There is also hand sanitizers available. So I would invite them to come back and be part of the community. We miss them. Bishop, just one final thought as we close. I am just so honored and thrilled to be the Bishop of Youngstown. And I look forward to working with the faithful and the clergy for many years to come. Bishop Bonner, I appreciate your presence on our show today. We look forward to being with you again next month. And in the meantime, God bless you and Godspeed. Thank you so much. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. Tomorrow, the church celebrates a feast of Saints Philip and James. To tell us more is Brother Dominic Calabro. He is from the Society of St. Paul in Canfield and the production assistant at CTNY. The Feast of Saints Philip and James dates from the 6th century to dedicate the Basilica of the Holy Apostles in Rome, where the relics of the two apostles were preserved. The Apostle Philip was born in Bethsaida in the Galilee and was called by Christ after he called Peter and Andrew. Philip responded immediately to the call and then approached his friend Nathanael with the announcement that he had found the one of whom Moses and the prophets spoke. Philip later preached the gospel in Phrygia and possibly Greece. He was martyred at Hierapolis and was buried there until his relics were transferred to Rome. James, the son of Alphaeus and brother of Jesus, is also known as James the Less. When he became head of the church in Jerusalem, he was known as James the Just. During the Council of Jerusalem, he spoke in favor of St. Peter's decision in the discussion about Gentile converts and the Jewish observances. He was martyred under the high priest Annas II. According to one account, he was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple, and since he was not yet dead, he was stoned. Finally, he was dispatched by a blow to the head with a club. His martyrdom took place in the year 62. The opening prayer of the Mass asked that we share in the suffering, death, and resurrection of God's only Son. The phrase in this prayer to come to the eternal vision of your glory, reminds us of Philip's request to see the Father, which he is explicitly stated in the communion antiphon. For us too, the desire to see the Father will be fulfilled if we know how, through faith, to unite Jesus to the Father, seeing the Father in the divine power and attributes of Jesus. Hence, in the prayer after communion, we ask, with the apostles Philip and James, may we see you in your Son. The antiphon for the Canticle of Zechariah presents Philip as a model for the apostolate. He does not attempt to force Nathanael to meet Jesus. He simply says, come and see. The prayer over the gifts contains the only reference to the letter of James, asking for a religion pure and undefiled. The description of religion in this context, reminiscent of the Old Testament, reminds us that the Apostle James was able to reconcile tradition with the new Christian religion is the prototype of the authentic Christian Jew. The message for us today is that we have sometimes separated the Old Testament from the New Testament to such an extent that we forget the Jewish roots and origins that are necessary for understanding the message of Jesus and the apostles. For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. Today I'm going to talk with Diana Hentarenko, who is a young adult minister at St. Angela Marici Church in Youngstown. Diana, it's a pleasure to have you on Spotlight. Thank you for having me. You know, for uh, many years you've been involved in youth and young adult ministry and ministry in the church. Tell the folks that are with us a little bit about how you started uh, your involvement with ministry in the church and especially how you got interested in young adults. Sure. So I started with ministry when I was about 14 years old. Mm -hmm. I really just 
just kind of felt this calling, felt this nudge. And so I was exploring some different possibilities and I had great leadership and mentors who were encouraging me. And so I took interest in social justice issues. I took interest in just many of the different things that were happening in the church, which eventually led to my discovery of a call to lay ecclesial ministry, which again was encouraged by mentors and my pastor at the time, Father Dan Van Glerick. I grew up at St. Charles Church in Boardman. And so then I just kind of set off on this trajectory of knowing that this is what I wanted to do. So I spent years working as a pastoral associate in evangelization. And when I was working as a pastoral associate of evangelization, one of the things that kept coming up was with my young age, many people were asking me, well, where are all the young people? And so that really came to light for me. And it, it really just sparked something in me that, okay, well, where are all the young people? So I really just started to ask some questions and do some research. And I became very passionate and felt very called to this end of ministry. Fast forward a few years later, I've started working for Father Kevin Peters at St. Angela Marici Parish, and I've been there for the last five years, and we've built up a wonderful young adult ministry initiative, and I've been there ever since, and it's, it's just been a wonderful experience. Let's talk about that young adult ministry, because it's different than youth ministry and younger, younger kids. So define what is young adult ministry? Sure. This is a very important distinction. Young adult ministry is ministry that deals with young people between the ages of 18 and 39, 18 being post high school. So mm -hmm. once they graduate from high school, then we try to welcome them into young adult ministry. So there's so much of life that happens during that period of time, but it is such a, a fruitful time of discovery, of discernment. Young people are, are figuring out what they want to do with their lives, mm -hmm. you know, who they want to be, who God mm -hmm. is calling them to be. So it's great to be intentional with them, to help them on that path of discovery, to work with them and to see what they can bring to the church and, and what the church can give to them. It's, it's really an exciting ministry. Let's talk about some of those influences that young adults experience. They're just getting out of high school. Mm -hmm. They're probably or most likely going to college mm -hmm. or looking at some kind of trade school. Sure. What's drawing them? What's kind of interfering sometimes with that openness to understanding what their life in the future should all be about? Sure. That's a very complicated question. There's so many things that, that can be influencing them. The one thing that I've noticed with young people, though, is that many of them do feel a call to service. Mm -hmm. They want their lives to matter. They want their lives to be meaningful. But sometimes that doesn't always line up with the pressures of financial situations, uh, crippling student loan debt. Sure. So if they're going to a four-year school, a four-year university, they're going to want to try to find a, a position that can allow them to pay their bills that can allow them to have a, a good life and certainly so and there's many uh, great positions out there that, that can have that happen mm -hmm. but what I'm hearing from young people is that they do want their life to serve the greater good and that can take many forms both within the church and in the secular world a lot of times there's influence from parents and from family mm -hmm. wanting them to maybe get into a family business or a family trade or maybe a parent has had a dream for what they want their young adult sure. to be in their life so there's a lot of things to sort through to yeah. help them figure figure out who God is calling them to be. I like to go back to that word service. Yes. I spoke with a college president not too long ago, and I asked them what was the most important thing in their university, and they said service. Mm -hmm. That was not something that at least I grew up with, mm -hmm. because it was more about academics or sports, mm -hmm. but service was an element that was really not even thought about. Why is service really important when we're talking about young adults? adults, but when we're talking about work in the church. I think for young people, again, it goes back to that notion that they want their lives to matter. They realize that what they do it does have an impact on the world around them. I think we tend to unfairly blanket young people as being selfish and not community oriented. My experience is completely the opposite. They do have a very strong mindset of wanting to do something for the greater good, of understanding that they do have things to offer that can be of benefit to other people. And so certainly they want to explore that possibility. There are so many ways too that that really enhances the church. It does enhance the gospel call 
call. It puts an example and it puts work to the gospel teaching, which is absolutely wonderful of, of love of neighbor, of being there for each other. And I think that's really taken on a life of its own. And it's something that young people really grab onto. In your experience, and also I think in my experience presently, when we look at some of the world issues that are complexing our complex world as it is, mm -hmm. we have a lot of young people who are out in the front, whether it's climate change or yes. racism or whatever the issue, and they feel extremely called to that. Is there a reason why young adults are a little more energized by something like that as opposed to some of us seasoned adults? You know, I'm not certain what the answer to that would be mm -hmm. other than I think it's just that growing up with technology, the world is smaller for sure. them. With social media, with the internet always being part of their life, mm -hmm. the world is so much smaller. Okay. So they're able to see how their actions do have an impact. They're able to connect with people around the country and around the world that have similar mindset and that care about causes. Information is at their fingertips to realize what their actions do and how they can impact the world around them. So I think that certainly brings to light just a new way of being in the world uh, for our young people, which is wonderful. And I think then they feel the call to step up because they know what's needed. And so they want to help others as much as they can. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Mothers and fathers help shape the lives of children God has blessed them with. Catholic Charities feels Mother's Day to Father's Day is the perfect time to hold the annual First Step for Change campaign. First Step for Change helps provide assistance to low-income pregnant women and families with young children in obtaining infant supplies such as formula, diapers, and clothing, as well as case management and parenting support. Last year, Catholic Charities First Step programs assisted over 600 households. Please support the collection at your parish this year from Sunday, May 9th through Sunday, June 20th or donate online at www.ccdoy.org or call the diocese for more information at 330-744-8451, extension 323. Hello, I'm Bishop Dave Bonner of the Diocese of Youngstown. At Easter, we recall the presence of the risen Lord among us. Over 2,000 years ago, he told his disciples, Remember, I am with you always, even to the end of time. As we celebrate his resurrection, may his gifts of love and joy fill your hearts and homes this Easter season. May our thanks and celebration of his dying and rising give us abundant life now and always. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. The song we have for you today is from the CD called Ave Maria. It is a collection of Marian songs. You were born to be the chosen one. Free of sin, you'd bear a son, the special one, the Son of God. And what a choice you made that day. To God you said, yes, have your way, your will be done. I'll be the one. You are the servant of the Lord. God's favor rests on you.
handmaid You brought forth life that forever stayed Loving all of us The Christ Jesus So when we fail to return His love Please pray for us to your Son above That we turn to Him To free our sins Blessed Mary, pray for us Pray that our sins will be free Help us gain what waits for us Our peace through Jesus And to tell us about the scriptures for this fifth Sunday of Easter is Father Matt Hummerkhaus. He is a parochial vicar at Holy Family Church in Poland and the sacramental minister at St. Luke Church in Boardman. We are all familiar with the expression, talk is cheap, or actions speak louder than words. In today's second reading, John says something similar. Let us love not in word or speech, but in deed and truth. He's expressing that we cannot merely say that we love each other, but we have to show people that we love them. We have all experienced people in our own lives, whether they be public figures or personal friends, that talk a big game and seem to have it all figured out. But in the end, they faded away, because talk is cheap. We cannot just love with words. If we say we are going to do something, we should do it. If we say that we will pray for someone, we should actually pray for them. Better yet, we could pray for them right there on the spot, together. Or send a text later in the day that says, I just prayed for you. Or, I'm about to send up some prayers. So that they know that you prayed for them. 
In the same way, we cannot just tell God that we love and trust him, while at the same time not fully handing over our lives to him. Do we run to the emergency room every time we have a sniffle? Do we freak out when our car breaks down because we're afraid that we can't afford the repair? Loving God and living out the Christian faith requires the cultivation of a certain disposition of the heart, where we have faith and we know that God is working powerfully in our lives in all kinds of ways. John goes on to tell his readers how to know if they belong to the truth. He reminds us that the Word of God is written on our hearts, and that if we follow our well-formed consciences, we can be assured in our hearts that we are on the right path. He reminds us of the one commandment he received from Christ himself, the commandment that comprises all of the rest and distinguishes the new covenant from the old. We should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. This is the commandment of the Lord, the summarization of all ten commandments. And if this one thing is accomplished, it is enough. Our faith is about more than the words that come out of our mouths, but about the actions that people see with our hands and our feet. That's what the Christian life is all about. Talk is cheap, but love does, because it's a verb. Let's pray together right now. Almighty God, we are so grateful for this day, this season, and all the wonderful gifts that you've given us. We come before you right now in humility, knowing that we are flawed creatures, and we invite you into our hearts and lives to transform us so that we can better understand and cooperate with your plan for our lives and our world. We especially ask that you allow these words that your Apostle John wrote to penetrate deep into our hearts, that we can be better at loving not in word or speech, but in deed and truth. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For Wineskins, I'm Father Matthew Hummerkaus. It is Easter and springtime in our Northern Hemisphere. How can we let the Holy Spirit fertilize our spiritual life this week? How can we be so abound with love that we bring abundant compassion to others? Wineskins is made possible through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda saying thank you for being with us, and we of CTNY want to wish our Orthodox sisters and brothers a blessed Easter. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. <laughs> what have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.